story time about one of the most horrific experiences I ever had as an introvert. When I was 15, I went to a basketball game with my dad, and it was a Lakers game to be specific. At one point during the game during intermission, the kiss cam came on, which as most of you know, the kiss cam is just a camera that zooms in on couples and asks them to kiss in front of the entire arena. It's like on a big screen. So the kiss cam is on, it's going to a bunch of people, they're all kissing, it's really, really cute. And then at one point, my face and my dad's face was on the kiss cam. So it said kiss with a heart with both of our faces in the heart. So we're kind of there like in shock, but we're like, okay, well, it's going to move on. Because usually when couples don't kiss or people don't kiss, the camera just moves on because it assumes they're not going to kiss. The thing is, the camera didn't move on. And the entire arena started to chant, kiss, 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 kiss. And after 40 seconds of chanting kiss without us kissing, the entire arena started to boo at us for not kissing. Entire arena booing at us. 15 years old, introvert, my dad, asked to kiss. Story time, and this is actually my mom's story. When my mom was 15, she was a boarding school student, except her school wasn't only a boarding school, it was also a daytime school. So students could choose to either be a boarding school student or a daytime school student. This one night, my mom, her boarding school friend, and their daytime school friend were hanging out, and around 7 p.m., the daytime school friend wanted to go home. Back then, cell phones were nothing, obviously, so the three of them had to leave campus to go to a phone booth to call a cab for her. So they leave the school and they walk alongside it and pass the forest because right next to the school was a forest. And as they're walking, a man that they don't recognize passes them. Then a few seconds later, a girl that they do recognize who went to the school also passes them. So they say hi to her and they keep walking to the phone booth. Eventually they reach the phone booth and they call a cab. And as they're waiting for a cab, suddenly they hear a girl screaming and a bunch of leaves rustling. So they're like, oh my God, what is happening? Then a few seconds later, the guy that had passed them suddenly runs past them really, really fast. So the guy ran past them just as the cab arrived. So my mom and her boarding school friend put their daytime school friend into the cab and the two of them walked back towards the forest to see if something happened, but no one was there. So the two of them then walked back to campus and went to the cafeteria because it was dinner time. And in the cafeteria, they saw the girl that had passed them just sitting at a table crying. So they went up to her to ask if she was okay. And when they went up to her, they saw that she had a knife mark on her neck and a knife mark on her wrist. So they were like, oh my God, we have to take her to the principal. They take the girl, bring her to the principal, and she tells them what happened. And the principal calls the cops and they take all their statements. Apparently, the guy had grabbed the girl, taken her into the forest, and held a knife to her neck and told her to be quiet. But because the girl knew that my mom and her friends were nearby, she started screaming and wouldn't stop screaming. That's why the guy let her go and ran off. Eventually, the guy ended up being arrested and put in jail for having raped girls as young as seven years old. Story time on how ditching my date landed me in love. Submitted by Anonymous. For reference, I very much liked to date. I always knew that I'd eventually find my person, but I had no issue with having fun until I did. When COVID first began, I set up a dating profile. Yes, a dating profile. Hoping that it would make it easier to find friends and dates, of course. I had a slew of them. And as enjoyable as they were, I was starting to get bored. So I started taking the dates a little bit more serious. Eventually, I chanced upon this girl. We had similar interests, like books and anime. When we were finally convinced that neither of us were serial killers, we decided to meet up in person. I chose a simple venue, coffee and a mini picnic at the park. She seemed over the moon about the entire idea. In my culture, it's custom to bring a gift on your first date, just the same as it is custom to bring a gift with you when you're meeting your significant other's parents. Needless to say, I put a lot of time and effort into her gift based on our conversations and how much I knew her, and you'll never believe how she responded to it. It's gonna sound cheesy, but I ended up buying her books, six to be exact, all named after her favorite flowers. I thought it'd be unique considering. She said that she liked to read, and she told me what her favorite flowers were. For some reason it just made sense, but she scoffed, I mean a genuine scoff, and just said, oh, gift cards would have been better, and proceeded to laugh right there in my face. <laughs> At this point I'm already contemplating leaving, but I wanted to give her a chance. By the end of the night I ended up regretting it. Her conversation was terrible, and her materialistic mindset was just too much. I took a few days to think it over, and ended up going on another date with her, hoping that I was just being too harsh at first. This date actually started out promising. We did karaoke, bowling, and decided to end the night with a dinner. For this particular restaurant, I ended up making reservations, because I wanted it to be special. We were nearly late, because she spotted someone she knew in the parking lot, and shooed me away to get the table. I'm sure you can guess what happened next. I tried to dismiss what happened in the parking lot. I chalked it up to simply being tired, especially since I had just gotten off work before actually picking her up for the date. My assumptions were correct, because when I entered the restaurant, I told the waitress, A table for two, please. 
in the most generic customer service voice I ever heard. She looked confused for two seconds. We stared at each other and both ended up laughing. In a mutual understanding, she showed me to my table and I sat there, I kid you not, for at least 10 minutes waiting on my date to come inside. Periodically, the waitress came to check on me, until at one point she simply sat down and genuinely asked me if I was okay. She was so genuine that I ended up explaining the entire situation. Then I asked her for her advice. She furrowed her eyebrows and looked away from me as if she were genuinely contemplating her response. When she was ready, she looked me dead in my eyes and said, you should either make her pay for the date or let her walk in and see you with someone else, someone better. You'll never believe which option I chose. Me being, well, me, I decided to just let her walk in and see me with someone else and the lovely waitress was happy to play along. In fact, she was just getting off work five minutes after I had gotten there, so I invited her to stay. We were able to order drinks and have conversations about our favorite animes and our favorite literary romances before my actual date entered the building. I expected her to be embarrassed and walk away, but she instead decided to engage in an argument with the waitress, an argument which led to my former date calling management in an attempt to get the waitress fired. Of course this didn't work, but it was oh so amusing to watch. The night ended with my former date leaving with the gentleman that she was talking to in the parking lot, and me driving home an amazing waitress that I've come to know as Lisa. Lisa who I have dated for four years, Lisa whom I have two amazing fur babies with and Lisa who I'm proposing to tomorrow night so to my former date thank you and to Lisa I love you ardently story time on when I caught my dad making out with my aunt submitted by Kelsey who prefers to not be tagged now for a little backstory I will admit that my parents have always been kind of strange strange in the aspect that they did not usually engage in large family function and my aunt which is flat out not though if my parents did manage to go to a large family function they only stayed for about 15 to 20 minutes maybe even an hour if they're lucky I personally never thought anything of it because at an early age my aunt explained to me that my parents were just small family oriented people they liked the intimacy of close-knit family functionings between them, my aunt, and I. So for me, this was normal. It wasn't until Thanksgiving of last year that things began to shockingly unravel. Now let's rewind to Thanksgiving of 2020. My parents and I decided to meet the rest of the family at my grandmother's house. And to my surprise, my aunt actually made an appearance. She didn't stay long, but long enough for me to see my family side-eyeing her the entire time. I assumed it was out of shock that she actually made an appearance to a family gathering. But I learned later that was not the case. There were some whispers shared about my aunt amongst my family, but none of my family would actually explain to me what they were whispering about because I'm a minor. Either way, it didn't take long for me to tell my parents that I was ready to go. My parents wasted no time saying their casual goodbyes, and my aunt followed shortly after. Since my mother cooked for Thanksgiving, we all met back at home. Once there, I went to my room to take off my nice clothes to put on my comfortable clothes. Don't act like you guys don't do the same thing. In the midst of picking out an outfit, I heard something strange. I could tell that it was voices that I was hearing, but they were hushed and kind of panicked? I thought my parents were perhaps talking about me since I kind of rushed them to leave my grandmother's house. Either way, me being me, I went to check it out. The noise was coming from my parents' bedroom. The conversation sounded something like this. You have to tell her, in my aunt's voice. How are you insane? It's bloody Thanksgiving, my father said. What other time to tell her, my aunt emphasized. So I peeked inside to see my father and my aunt full-blown making out. So I did what any rational human being would do. I burst open the door and yelled, Mom, they're kissing! When my mother finally made it up the stairs, she moved in between me and the doorway. They were kissing, I said outraged, and the weirdest expression played on my mom's face. She took a deep sigh and looked towards my dad and my aunt. Did you tell her? My mother questioned. My dad let go of my aunt and slightly backed away from her, as if he was just now ashamed of what he had been doing. Of course not. We wouldn't have said anything without you, he answered, as if appalled that she would think that he would do such a thing. I, on the other hand, was fed up with this, and I was cursing them all, telling them that someone needed to explain something to me before I fought everyone. My aunt finally stepped forward to speak. We thought that Thanksgiving would be a good time to tell you about your family. I frowned. What's wrong with my family? They all looked at each other as if they were hiding something again. So I repeated myself in a more direct tone. My aunt put her hands together in front of her body and looked me straight in the eyes to tell me that she was not my aunt. In fact, she was nowhere near blood related to me. She was my father's and my mother's girlfriend and had been since before I was born. And the crazy thing is, everyone knew but me. 
Story time on how I got one of my school's worst teachers fired. It was my second year in high school, and I was excited to start the new year. But at the same time, I was nervous because I had a lot of new teachers that I'd never met. One of which was a teacher that I had heard the worst things about. But I figured if I just stayed quiet and sat in the back, that I'd be fine. So class starts and I'm taking notes. Halfway through my note-taking process, I notice that the teacher had made his way to my desk. He then tells me how disrespectful I am for having my Bluetooth headphones in while he's teaching. Aggressively and repeatedly, he tells me to take them out and give them to him. I laughed for a moment because I didn't think he was talking to me, but when I realized he was, I shrugged, took them out, and handed them to him. I thought this would be the end of it, that he would leave me alone. Instead, he made snide remarks about me throughout the entire class period, according to my friends. Finally, towards the end of class, he yelled my name repeatedly to answer a question that he'd asked, and when I didn't respond, he started bad-mouthing me, saying I was insubordinate and ignorant. So I simply told him that I could not hear him because he took my hearing aids. So Mr. B, how's that unemployment treating you? This is why you should triple check people on dating apps before going out with them. A story time. A long time ago, before I met my now long-term boyfriend, I was a single Pringle. And I was pretty bored to be honest. So sometimes I was on dating apps. I met a few normal people, but honestly I was mostly using it to boost my ego. Aren't we all kind of doing that? Don't lie to yourself. Anyway, I met this guy. He was like four and a half years older than me. But don't worry, I was 18, so it was legal, okay? And he was nice, he was funny, all of that. After like a month of dating, we're like, okay, we're gonna go get some drinks. And we finally meet, and the date goes really well. He's polite, he's kind, but as we all know, when things look too good, they're not. So I put him in my I'm trying to find out what's wrong with you file keep on going out for like a couple of weeks then the first red flag popped up there were some inconsistencies but i couldn't even expect what was coming part two on my page this is why you should always triple check people you meet on dating apps part two so i start seeing my first red flags about this dude he lied about where he lived like why would you do that that is some shady business and at first i was like okay maybe he just doesn't want me to know where he lives but the red flags just kept coming in. He had a second phone. And it wasn't like his work phone or something. The man just had two phones. And as the unbothered person I am, I was like, sure. But that's none of my beeswax. And also, we kept meeting in this one cafe. And we didn't go anywhere else. He was just like, I like it here. My dude. He really did think I was stupid. Since he was getting really suspicious, I decided to end things. A couple of weeks later, I get a friend suggestion on Facebook from a woman. I go to her page and notice she has pictures with him and it turns out it was his wife. So he was married the whole time. This is going to be kind of a disjointed story time, but I'm shaking. I went to New York this weekend to pick my daughter up from her father's house and we had to fly home today. The second flight kept getting delayed and the airline said we could change our flight for free. So we went for that and we had to get a hotel for the night. Way better than spending the night in the airport. Anyway, we got us in this real fancy hotel for real cheap. The woman who checks us in says if you go to the bar, they have snacks, drinks, whatever. And we love snacks. So we went to the bar. So I go to talk to the bartender and this old man next to me, I watch him pick up his phone and turn it towards my daughter and myself. My automatic reaction was to put my hand up and then I heard the picture snap and then I caught a scene. He said, did you just take a picture of my daughter and me? And he's like, you don't understand. I just thought you were both beautiful. I said, I don't give a shit. You don't take a picture of someone and their kid. He pulled his phone back out and he's like, do you want me to delete it? He had his camera roll and I said, I'll delete it for you. I took it from him. I deleted it. I scared that old man. And the bartender was there to back me up. Did I overreact? No. I don't care what that man's intentions were. I felt unsafe and he could talk about how my sister escaped from the hospital. <laughs> My sister decided to visit a hospital that will remain unnamed because I believe she had food poisoning. After they checked her in, they brought her to a room and basically left her there for over 30 minutes. When they finally did come in and see her, they put an IV in her arm without telling her what medicine was actually in the IV. She then explained that she started to feel really strange, strange to the point where she started to become paranoid. In her paranoid state, she ended up ripping out her IV, literally sneaking out of her room, and somehow making it all the way to the elevator and all the way past the front desk without being stopped. She couldn't exactly think straight, but she managed to make it across the street, where she sat on a bench and attempted to call my brother-in-law. He didn't answer a few times, so she started to become frantic. Her panic got worse when she could see her hospital room from where she was sitting and saw someone walking around in her room like for part two. 
So the person walking around in my sister's hospital room was a nurse coming in to check on her. When the nurse noticed that my sister was gone, she ended up talking to the front desk and the front desk ended up calling my sister. On the call, they basically asked her where she was and if she was alright. My sister ended up telling them that she no longer wanted services and that she was across the street waiting on her husband to come pick her up. Even though my brother-in-law hadn't even answered the phone yet, they informed her that for her safety they would be sending an ambulance to come and pick her up. Naturally, my sister hung up on them and it caused her paranoia to skyrocket. She ended up full-blown running to the nearest McDonald's and frantically calling my brother-in-law, leaving him several messages saying, you have to come pick me up, they're coming to get me, and that he had to get there before they did. Without actually explaining who they was, my brother-in-law, not knowing what was going on, began to panic and called her several times to figure out what was going on. When he finally did answer, he told her he was speeding in the car trying to find her like for part three. Luckily, my brother-in-law did end up finding her just in time. He proceeded to take her home, tuck her in, and watch over her for the rest of the night. It wasn't until a day or two later that he was finally able to put the pieces together with her and realized that my sister had generally just left the hospital and that the they that she was referring to was the hospital staff. He ended up telling her that people are fully capable and allowed to leave the hospital whenever they please. There was no need for sneaking unless you were admitted against your will and she of course was not. They are able to laugh about the situation now. However, my brother-in-law will stop at nothing to tell this story over and over. And he refuses to let my sister live this down. He's promised her for years that he'd get her back for this. But to this day, he cannot think of a scheme brilliant enough to make her feel the way that he did on this day. To this day, my sister still hasn't been back to that hospital and she will not accept calls from them. <laughs> she tried to kill and replace me out of jealousy. So I was in middle school and I would say I was one of the popular kids. Everyone liked me and I made everyone laugh. Tons of boys chased after me as well, but there was one girl who didn't like me. Let's call her Agnes. Agnes was a part of a group of bullies, but the friend group liked me. She just didn't. Sometimes she would make fun of me and tease me. I'm not going to lie, it bothered me, but I didn't care. So we each had one period where we knew of each other, but we didn't have any friends in that period. So I decided, why not try and befriend her? I then walked up to her and said hi and I said, why don't you like me? She just looked at me in shock. She told me she didn't dislike me. So then I asked her if we could be friends and she said, okay. We got along so well. We continued being friends, but she got a little obsessive over time, I'm not gonna lie. She would want to hang out every day and would throw a hissy fit if I had plans or wanted time for myself. One day she came over and asked if she could wear one of my shirts and I agreed. Then she changed her hairstyle and started talking like me. We both laughed. And then the next day at school, she literally looks like me. And you will not believe what happened next. Come back for part two. The next day at school, I thought she looked just like me. She wore the same hairstyle as me, the same makeup, the same shirts. I don't know how she got the same shirt as me. And she wore the same short style, but in a different color. She walked up to me in a chirpy manner and said, hey, Annalise. I said, hi back. I was confused though. She wore goth clothing. This was nothing like her. So my usual group of friends came up to me and said, hello. And they said, hello, who's this? And I said, Agnes. They all looked in shocked. One of the girls said she looked cute. And Agnes said, thank you. So my group of friends told me that we were going to a skating rink later and if I wanted to come, and I agreed. They asked if Agnes could come too, and I said yeah. So after that, she kept hanging out with us repetitively, and I didn't really have an issue with it. I liked that she was becoming a new positive person, but she was still so clingy to me. She wanted to hold hands with me all the time, which was really annoying. So then one day, she asked me if I can go to her house alone. I've never been to her house before, and I don't like going to new people's houses alone. But I decided to go anyways. What was the harm? So I went to her house, and you will not believe what happened next come back for part three so i don't usually go to people's houses first time by myself i usually go with a friend or two but i decided to go anyways so when i got there everything was fine her house was clean it wasn't dirty or anything like that it was a little too clean it was kind of weird but i just brushed it off i asked where her parents were and she said they were working at the moment i was like oh okay do you know what time to get home and she said she didn't know which was kind of weird so we ended up going to her room and it was a completely different style from what she's dressed as well. Kind of looked similar to mine again. So she said she was going to go make me a drink in the kitchen and I said okay. Something just wasn't sitting right with me so I kind of followed behind her without her knowing. So I saw her assembling my drink and literally I saw her put two pills in there. I don't know what they were but I'm sure they weren't healthy. So I ran out of the house and I never looked back. The next day at school I completely ignored her and told everyone what happened and everyone started to not like her. Lesson learned, don't trust someone who wanted to be you. Follow for more story times and follow my Instagram as well. Business account and caption. Okay, story time. <laughs>
Now y'all better buckle up for this one because there's a lot to it. I'm just gonna start from the beginning. So about seven years ago when I was in college, I got my first girlfriend. And both of us were still heavily in the closet. After a few months of dating, we told our friends at school, but our family and friends back at home still didn't know. And whenever I would go home to visit, it felt like I was living a double life and I still had so much shame around who I was and my sexuality. And one weekend, I decided to go home and visit my parents. My college was only like 45 minutes away. <laughs> and one of the days, my parents left for a few hours, so I invited my girlfriend over. And we were hanging out at my house and then my parents came home. And we were like, oh fuck. So we told my parents that we were meeting friends at the movies. <laughs> So we left my house and went to the movies, but it was just us, obviously. <laughs> and after the movies, we wanted to still hang out, but we didn't have anywhere to go. <laughs> and for some reason, we thought it would be a smart idea to park in an empty Target parking lot at 11 p.m. all alone in my town. And that's when shit goes down. Go to part two. Ah! Okay, so after my girlfriend and I went to the movies in my town, again, we were still not out yet to our family and friends back at home. We wanted to still hang out, but we had nowhere to go, so we decided to park in an empty Target parking lot at 11 p.m. It was pretty fucking obvious to anyone driving by that we were doing something suspicious, okay? <laughs> so we go in the back seat of my car. We start taking each other's clothes off. Oh, shit. We getting freaky deaky in the back seat, bitch. Yes. And then all of a sudden, we see someone drive up and we see the red and blue flashing lights. At this point, we're shaking and not the good kind. <laughs> so we're freaking out, trying to put our clothes on, trying to button our pants. Clothes are flying everywhere. And the cop was like, get out of the car. <laughs> if I get out of the car, my pants still unbuttoned. He asks for my ID. And I'm like, oh God, not the ID. If I give him my ID, he's gonna know. So I hand him my ID and go to part three. <laughs> Okay, so, oh my god! After my girlfriend and I were getting it on in the back seat and the cops pulled up, he asked us to get out of the car and then asked for our IDs. And that's when I really started panicking. And I'm like, what do I do? If I give him my ID, he's gonna see my name. So I hand him my ID. And I'm sweating, partly because of the back seat action and also because of what he's about to find out. And he looks at it and he goes silent. And I'm just staring at him like, and he goes, oh, uh, are you related to? And I'm like, yes, yes, I am. And he's like, what's the relation? And I said, that's my dad. My dad was his boss, the chief of police. And I started fucking bawling and I go, please don't tell my dad. He doesn't know about this. And he let us go. And to this day, I still don't know if my dad found out. <laughs> The Kardashians are culture vultures. Now, before I explain why, I just like to say that I'm not trying to come for the Kardashians, okay? I value my life and I'm just a small town girl stating her opinion and fact. So if you don't want to see the truth, that's on you. Now, with all that being said, let's uh, dig in and sip this tea, shall we? So there's no denying that the Kardashians are a beautiful bunch. And I do have to tip my hat off to them and acknowledge their business acumen because they did build an empire. But at what expense? Well, at the expense of people of color, that's what. I'm talking about the time Kim decided to call her shaper line kimono and allegedly try to trademark the name. I'm talking about the time Kim posted a picture with a traditional Indian headpiece only worn on special occasion. And I'm talking about all the times the Kardashians imitated and profited off of black culture. I'm not even gonna get into what they did to Dizita Balamle and Brandy because I don't have time, but they have basically built their careers by adopting styles created by black women and other people of color and making them more palatable for society. Think that's all I've got to say? No, no, there's a part two. Now let's get something straight. There's a difference between cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation, but the Kardashians are constantly blurring the line between the two. And I'm willing to bet they know exactly what they're doing. They just choose not to care because remember, Mama Jenner didn't raise no fools. They know that any press is good press. There's no denying that they hold enormous influence, but what's problematic is that what they're doing plays into this long-time fascination with the aesthetic of blackness. They're hailed as trendsetters and innovators, yet their style choices rely on racial performance, and while they profit off of it, the marginalized groups that they borrow from are rarely celebrated by society in the way that they are. Sure, they have an Armenian background, but lest we forget, the two youngest sisters are white. In fact, they have played a huge role in normalizing and popularizing black fishing because our society lauds ambiguous, exotic-looking white women yet condemns black women for the same traits. And that's not the end of my expose. No, no, there's a part three. The Kardashians fetishize black women's features and adopt their aesthetic without actually having to live the black experience. They've been called out for cultural appropriation multiple times yet choose to hide behind the fact that they have relationships and children with black men rather than addressing the problem at hand. Having kids with black people doesn't automatically shield you from being culturally insensitive. That's not how it works. Simply 
simply wearing something because you like it isn't always okay. We don't live in a post-racial society yet, so in order to appreciate something, it's important to know and understand its history. And the Kardashians all too often decide to sport something or morph into it without acknowledging the historical and racial context of the culture they're taking it from. So you know what? If y'all are interested, I'm willing to do a series on all the styles they've imitated in the past and talk about their origin and history. In fact, y'all can let me know which hairstyle, fashion style, or body style you've seen on a Kardashian that you'd like me to talk about. I think it's high time we start leaning into cultural exchange rather than cultural appropriation because if the Kardashians won't do it well hell, the small town girl will. All right guys, so I was at work today and my boss came up to me and told me that apparently one of my coworkers feels as if I don't like him because apparently in his book, I never say hi to him, I never speak to him, and he has tried everything in the book to make me like him. I proceeded to tell my boss that I do say hi to him whenever he says hi to me and I do speak to him whenever he speaks to me. Personally, I am not obligated to say hello or have a conversation with him if I do not want to. Me, as an employee, my obligation to my fellow co-workers is to not harass them, respect their boundaries, and not distract them from doing their work. Anything other than that, I don't give a fuck about. I am not obligated to talk to you. And personally, my form of being cordial is being silent, whether I like you or not. I do not understand why my silence is such an issue for some people. And this has been something that has gone on in almost every single job I've had. If I don't feel like personally talking to somebody, now I'm a bitch and it's my fault and I'm being uncooperative. Like, what the fuck? I went to NYU, New York University, a university in and of the city. <sighs> Sorry, don't know what came over me there. And there's a lot of like very cool indie people that go to that school. And my freshman year, I tried really hard to be cool and indie myself, but all of my attempts to do so ended in just complete disaster. Like the one time I hopped the subway turnstile to impress people, I got ticketed, the police caught me. But I think the best story is when I thrifted this old t-shirt and this t-shirt had a word on it that I wasn't familiar with, but I assumed it was some old brand name. And when I was wearing it out, I was like, oh, I'm so cool wearing my thrifted vintage shirt. But then this girl was like, do you know what your shirt says? And I was like, no. The word on my shirt was FUPA, which stands for fat upper pussy area. It refers to when a woman's labia is so large it covers the vaginal hole. But I had already left, like I was late for class. I had to wear it out all day. <laughs> You see, I draw scary art not because I'm mentally unsound, but because I have chronic nightmares. Anytime I fall asleep for any duration, I have a nightmare. Here's the worst one I've ever had. One time I dreamt that someone was sewing a dead rat in my mouth, and then he said, you know what, I'll give you a minute. If you manage to leave this building, you'll get off scot-free. I won't kill you. So I'm like, all right, I make a break for it, and this, this house is just built like a never-ending hotel hallway. So I'm like, well, I'm never going to get out. So I pick a random room for these never-ending infinite rooms. And I lock the door behind me and I look and there's just this person sitting by a fireplace. His head is shaped like a clam and he's very tiny. And I go, Ayo, dog, I'm going to die in a minute. Can you tell me a cool story? And he looks at me and he takes out this pacifier with thumbtacks coming out of the squishy part, puts it in his mouth, and then gives birth to a rotting baby out of his mouth. And while it's still attached to the umbilical cord, it starts talking in unknown tongues in a grown man's voice. And the rat comes to life in my mouth and is clawing to get out, but there's no mouth because my mouth healed itself shut. Not only did this traumatize me to the point where I had to get a Batman onesie from Goodwill, but also I had to get a mohawk.